You ready? Okay, so we need actually consensus making on the agenda. We had two, a fork of the agenda. We had one on the website <laughs> and one which is handed out. So I'm going to re reconcile the fork with my f uh, fork <laughs> consensus rules. And Juan, <laughs> you have the floor on the distributed web for the internet uh, IPFS. Take it away. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So quick show of hands. How many people know what IPFS is already? Cool. It's a substantial amount. So uh, we like to call the IPFS the distributed web because it's a, an effort to make websites and web applications operate in a distributed context. Uh, another name for IPFS is also the permanent web or the Merkle web. Uh, and IPFS is a protocol to upgrade how the web works, uh, but IPFS loves blockchains in general. Uh, it's in a sense inspired by the same tech that a blockchain is inspired by, which is the Merkle tree. Uh, and in a sense, IPFS is also a protocol to upgrade blockchains themselves. Uh, the structure of this talk is that I'll, I'll talk a bit about the web and why there are some problems there that we are trying to address. Uh, some of the things that have been discussed in this conference will feature there uh, to some extent. Uh, I'll describe what IPFS is and how it's structured. I'll talk about how it relates to blockchains. Uh, and I'll conclude, if there's time, w which I doubt, uh, with a discussion on how the on the project itself, uh, because I think it has a lot to say about how the internet gets patched uh, today uh, and how major developments happen in, in general. All right, so I, I like starting with this image because it is a, a very clear uh, construction of the different kinds of networks. And this, is, this comes from Paul uh, Barron, who uh, was one of the inventor, inventors of packet switching way back. Uh, this was when uh, AT&T was switching, or, or like the telcos were switching from switch lines to packet switching way before the internet. And he characterized networks as being either centralized, decentralized, or distributed. Uh, and the major point here is that in a centralized network, uh, it's easy to think about it because there's just one thing that does all the work and a bunch of clients. Decentralized networks kind of shard that and gain some replication uh, or, or some resiliency. But it's not until you go completely distributed and peer-to-peer. -peer. It's not until you go where the protocol is the same everywhere and every single entity runs the same pieces of code, or you know, in, in their case, in hardware, uh, that you get, get this kind of fabric um, that you can break apart in any, any kind of way and the whole thing will still kind of work. Uh, and so when you think about the internet uh, and the protocols that make it up, uh, there's, of course, agreement that helps uh, understand how the, th that helped made and formulate uh, this amazing machine that we, that we have. Uh, and it's all really about specs, code, and computers, right? We have a whole bunch of ideas that we synthesize into agreements, into protocols. We turn those into code, uh, which means just taking the ideas in the specs and massaging them into a program, and then we run the programs. This means the internet is extremely malleable. It means that anybody can actually come in and change the internet. All they have to do is come up with a set of ideas that are good enough, implement it, and ship it. If it's successful, people will adopt it, and people will use it, and people will eventually make it part of the core of the internet. This is what happened to Bitcoin. This is why we're here today, uh, because somebody, one person, potentially more, but most likely one person, uh, came up with a bunch of ideas, wrote the specs for it and the code, uh, and then shipped it. And the powerful thing here is that when you think about something like the web and how difficult it would be to remake and reshape how the web actually works, uh, it's not actually insane at all to propose to upgrade the entire web. Uh, in fact, we're doing it already. We have lots of over between 50 and 100,000 websites already run on IPFS. So that's uh, an interesting uh, amount. Uh, all right. So the web and the internet are not the same thing, right? The internet is the wires, the web is the applications on top of those wires and those computers. And when you think about the applications that we run uh, today on the web, these applications more and more rule all of our lives. Uh, think about how much data that you generate goes into some of these web applications, not uh, you know, through companies and so on, not through the mail, but through directly web applications, like you're using HTTP to connect to some other computer and send some data and receive some data back. 
uh, we're talking about your learning, we're talking about your personal documents, your company documents, we're talking about all of the communications that you do with the mo people that most matter most to you, your personal relationships, your work relationships, your overall almost everything, right? Uh, <laughs> And, and the crazy thing is that the web has some problems uh, and some pretty critical issues that we need to address before it becomes uh, a major, major issue. And one of them is, it, recasting this image, is that the web, though it started in a distributed sense in this kind of very peer-to-peer -peer notion that everyone was going to run both an HTTP server and a client and be able to share documents with each other, it's completely centralized now. Uh, we run browsers and we consume content from web servers and we talk to the web servers through like these little um, carefully, con carefully constructed ways. Uh, but you as a web browser don't really get to publish data into the network. It, it's everything is mediated by a set of servers. Uh, which also means that if you want to download data, you have to go and bring it down from those servers and it becomes an extremely inefficient mess, right? Like if all of you right now started downloading Gangnam Style, uh, we could even suppose that there were seven or eight links in between, we would uh, end up wasting tons of bandwidth. Uh, we actually ca calculated, based on the number of views uh, when I made this slide, uh, it's about almost 500 petabytes of data coming off of Google servers, let alone times eight for all those links, you know, depending times whatever the diameter of the network is. Gets worse when you think about offline use cases, right? So if all of us were collaborating on a Google document or some sort of uh, application through the web and the internet fell apart, uh, you know, our connection to the internet fell apart, it would just cease operating. The web, web apps are not designed today to continue to operate in the offline case. They are not offline first. Uh, and at the time that I made the slide as well, there's all these other very critical pieces of humanity now that just cease to work if your latency or bandwidth are above or below certain limits. And I think this is unacceptable. I think that we as engineers need to pick up the game here and fix this major problem uh, because it actually is really critical when you think about how people are using these things. Uh, we tend to design web applications as this you know, thing that kind of is supposed to work in the best case and we hand them out to people and people fall in love with them and they use them all the time. And then we don't stop to think about what happens when the model of execution that we thought about isn't the one that applies in their daily life. We don't stop to think about when their connectivity breaks and that dependence that they developed on the software we created uh, ends up hurting them quite a bit. Uh, and uh, you know, think about like all the devices that people are getting nowadays and you know, think about Internet of Things and so on. These things aren't capable of sharing data through the web at all. They share it through usually um, native protocols that they implement. Uh, the whole idea of this amazing idealized web of documents that we were all gonna share and collaborate through and these webs of applications don't extend into mobile and don't extend into the Internet of Things yet. Uh, and so this is another problem. Like the web is getting kicked out of these devices. Uh, and the, the value that the web brought by integrating everything together is being stopped uh, from entering here. And so this is another issue that we need to fix. There's of course information silos. Uh, when you think about uh, all of the databases out there of the big social networks, it's really their data, right? Like it's, it's sort of your data, but not really. It's like you sort of have rights on it, but they control it. And certainly you can't link it to each other. You can't link it to other pieces of data on the web in such a way that will remain there should that website shut down or kick you out or whatever. Uh, so that data is... The, the whole point of the web was to create pieces of data that link to each other, and if that, all of that is mediated through specific entities, then the utility and value of your data depends on those entities. I think the people that know this best uh, are the people of Egypt, when uh, suddenly they woke up one morning to the fact that their internet had been completely shut down and their communications were gone. Uh, people had been communicating with each other through social networks and so on, and suddenly, nothing worked. And so this is again another problem. When you design a communications system or a communications application and you don't think about what happens when a government decides to shut down 
in internet access for people, that's a big problem. Of course, thankfully, people uh, deployed mesh networks and so on, and, and they were managed to get internet access back, but that's not a given. And so applications need to be built to deal with these kinds of use cases. Uh, applications need to run in local area networks. Think about, okay, so that was a man-made disaster, but what about natural disasters? What happens to the web then? What happens to all these communication infrastructures when there's earthquakes, floods, you know, super volcanoes exploding, right? I mean, what, what do we do then? What happens if major disasters happen to data centers and suddenly we don't have our data anymore? A company will say, sorry, we lost it. What are we, we I mean, natural disaster, we didn't account for that. Um, and of course, a few companies do and actually are big enough that they do think about this sort of thing and they do replicate your data across a few data centers, but it's not perhaps as replicated or as safe as you might believe, and it's not as safe as you may want it to be. There's also the problem of book burning, right? I mean, we have been uh, criticizing book burning as this horrible thing that happens when a society kind of goes crazy, and we think see book burning as this the ultimate sin against humanity. We see humanity as the product of language and technology and knowledge. Uh, those are the things that distinguish us. Uh, and yet, some societies burn books, and we see this as a, a trait of the things going really, really badly. Uh, and yet today, we burn books all the time. We burn books daily. We burn books every day whenever you move an, a document on the web and, and a URL no longer points to where it used to. Whoever had a link to it and now cannot see it, uh, for them, it's a book burned. For them, they may not be able to find that document anymore. They may not be able to access it. They may not even have a search that works fully. So the critical point of the web, which was to create this idealized notion of documents linked to each other, uh, has a problem. These documents are documents on computers and you can burn those links, and you can burn those computers too. So these are some of the critical, critical problems. I, I hope that I've inspired in you a sense of the urgency of these matters and why it is important to upgrade the web. So IPFS is this project to make the web work in the distributed case, work offline first, be more permanent, uh, be safer on the, to the user, move the content around in a smarter way, and of course be faster, because if you don't make it faster, no one's gonna use it. Uh, actually, this all started by trying to make it faster, and then after a while, all of the other properties kind of fell out, which is cool. Uh, IPFS is a hypermedia transport protocol, the same thing as HTTP, and the goal is to match the interface exactly. Uh, things shouldn't have to change. Web applications should not be different at all. Um, you should still be able to run anything that you run on HTTP over IPFS with minimal to no mo modification. Some things will be harder, of course, like the more complicated web applications will be more difficult to, to translate, but you'll gain some very interesting properties. IPFS is the product of uh, looking back uh, through the last kind of 25 years of development since the web has been created and think about what the web would have looked like today if, we, if those ideas had been around when Tim Berners-Lee invented the web. So we, we've come up with a whole bunch of good ideas, right, since the web, invention of the web. What would it look like if those kind of made it in? And you might think, because we're at the blockchain workshop, why isn't Bitcoin there? Why isn't the blockchain sort of like part of this? Well, uh, Bitcoin and the blockchain didn't come up with Merkle links. That was kind of an older idea. Uh, so <laughs> it would have made it, but uh, it was kind of already done. Uh, and so these protocols kind of separate out into a stack. The web is, of course, the great application platform that we know. Uh, SFS was a fantastic protocol uh, that made sure that we have a secure way to do naming. Uh, Git gives us the whole notion of version, versioning of data and Merkle links. That's where I, I, I learned about them. They're even older, but uh, I learned about them in Git. And of course, BitTorrent has this amazing way of moving around content very efficiently through networks, and DHDs allows us to find contents. And the whole thing is, is designed so that it works over any network. Uh, so this is not true of HTTP. Uh, HTTP, you can make it work over any transport, but in general, most web servers just don't do that. They only work over TCP. So if you wanted to run the web over Bluetooth, if you wanted to run the web over audio or something like that, you have to work really, really hard to do that, which means that nobody does it. And so the, the stack kind of breaks down uh, into these sections, something we we're calling libp2p, which is a set of protocols that a whole bunch of other projects could use, and really the core part, which 
we're nicknaming either the Merkle DAG or the Merkle Web or IPLD. Um, and that is the core part of the protocol. The idea is to come up with one core format that makes sense for all of these distributed data structures, for all these distributed systems that want to interact through the web, through the network, uh, and address content uh, with each other and move it around. And so the, the stack here, there's a set of protocols in this stack that you can see that are IPFS specific, but the whole point is that you could swap them out. You could, you could actually use HTTP as an exchange in IPFS. You could use um, other kinds of uh, transports like WebRTC or UTP and so on. And, and you could have a, a version of IPFS working entirely over Tor and ITP, which is really critical when you think about preserving privacy and security uh, in the web for people. Uh, in a sense, this is the internet of data. Uh, IP was such a good idea because it created this thin waste around the IP protocol. We're doing the same thing, but for data itself. So we're coming up with like the, the, the thin waste of what it means to define um, these data structures that are distributed. And it's not just data, it's just data structures. Uh, it's, you, you need a way to express data structures the same way that other people express them today. And if you have ever used Git, you know that it's a Merkle tree or something like it. And uh, I won't explain fully uh, what a Merkle tree is. Uh, if you've heard about a blockchain, the whole idea is that you have some block and you have the hash pointing to the previous block and that creates this chain of links. That's all that a Merkle link really is, and that's the property that we care about. But the point is that uh, Git and a whole bunch of other protocols have these different trees. Uh, there's all these different separate repositories of information, uh, and even Bitcoin and blockchains are this massive Merkle tree, like this huge chain. Um, all along the way, you have this, these Merkle links. IPFS is a Merkle forest. The whole point is to bridge together the distinct different systems by coming up with the same way of linking between them. Uh, so you can think of Bitcoin and, and Git and BitTorrent and that and so on as pieces of the same system as a whole, um, the web, basically, right? Like this is what the web is supposed to be, a way to link between these things. We're just making it so that these other really cool systems and important systems can continue to do what they do best, but still preserve linkability. Uh, and you, when you think about blockchains today, you can also think about Ethereum also uh, emerging as this other massive uh, blockchain, right? And so you can see this massive Merkle forest that we're helping to create. Uh, and again, the point is to uh, upgrade the internet, upgrade the web in such a way where um, we make the developer's life easier. Because ultimately, if you make an improvement uh, and you manage to make it, make some really complicated thing very easy for developers, uh, you've succeeded in that that's how you achieve progress on the network. Uh, if, you, if you come up with a protocol and it's really great, but like your implementation isn't helpful or friendly to developers, thanks, but try again. Uh, it's just not gonna, it's not gonna move the needle. It's gonna have to wait until somebody else uh, manages to bring that down. Uh, so I mentioned that IPFS loves blockchains and this is because a blockchain is just a, a, a Merkle link data structure like any other, which means you can put them entirely on IPFS and use it as a transport. Uh, when you think about a blockchain, again, you have this block with some data, uh, and you, know, you have another block pointing to the previous one, and the key part here is that there is some link that is a hash, right? So the block on the left, when you hash that, you get the value that goes into, that is included in the block on the right. And this is a Merkle link. Uh, you get the ability to check integrity of this huge chain as it's forming uh, through that property. Of course, blockchains have this additional thing or at least in particular the Bitcoin uh, blockchain has this extra thing where, where you try to um, do this proof of work to figure out, to get a, a, a solve a puzzle around the hash being under a certain target difficulty and so on. But that's not that important for IPFS. The whole point is it is a transport for Merkle data structures. When you look deeper at a, at a, a blockchain, uh, it is pointing to a set of transactions, right? These, this is, these are all still Merkle links. And the transactions that aren't yet included are sort of in a pool somewhere. Uh, and the process of extending the chain is taking the transactions that are valid and putting them into blocks and extending the chain. What happens when you, when you wanna include you know, data on the chain that doesn't fit? Uh, we've talked this entire conference about including things like contracts and records and important documents and so on in the blockchain, but 
uh, you can't actually put it in there through a transaction because you don't want every single node ever to have to, to, to store it. So you do the same thing that the blockchain does and you put a hash to it as a link, right? Uh, but these, these, this content, which by the way is, is starting to be all sorts of stuff, there's like legal records, contracts, code, emails, <laughs> I've seen email over Bitcoin, uh, pretty much anything, right? What, but what happens with those links? You can't click on a link like that. Uh, there's just some hash, right? So now you have to take that hash and figure out what other system uh, it belongs to. And so, and by the way, some of these files are getting huge. Like I've seen some massive archives hash in there because you want to timestamp important details. The, the problem though is how do you make sure that all of the content remains addressable? If you were to put a link to HTTP there, then you don't get any of the integrity that you wanted because of course anybody could change the server or something and the file would be different. Um, and again, to, to review HTTP for people that, that don't recall how it works, you, you have this, the internet, you have a whole bunch of servers, uh, and if you want a specific file, you have to talk to a specific uh, server to get it back, or a specific set of servers. Um, even if a whole bunch of other computers in the network have it, it doesn't matter, you have to go to talk to a specific one. And there's, there's a reason for this. It made sense at the time, uh, but maybe not anymore. So of course, if you want to put it in the blockchain, you don't do that, you put the hash of the content. Uh, so why don't we build a system to just address everything by hash? And yes, there are some already, uh, but the point is why don't we make the web itself work this way? And this is what IPFS is about, making the web itself work with a hash-based file system. Uh, and so instead of this picture, you get a picture where any node that has the content can distribute the content to you because again, you need no trust. Uh, it's the same thing um, as you get in, in BitTorrent, the same thing you get in Git, the same thing you get in Bitcoin blockchains and so on. But the benefit is that uh, it's a file system, right? Like we're talking about it's good to store rock records and documents and, and directories and so on. Uh, and the resolution works exactly as you would expect it to work in a file system, the same way that you would expect it to work in the web. You, have, you can have directories that point to other uh, objects and so on. This is exactly what Git did and why it became so, so successful. Uh, these are of course Merkle links. And uh, if people kind of think of know what Git did and why it was successful, the whole idea was that there was a previous version control system called uh, SEN and before that there was CVS and so on. And the model was that it, it was centralized, right? You had one server maintaining your versions and everyone would talk to that one server. And so to make any update, you would have to ship that, that update to that server. Uh, this was not very robust or resilient. If you cut any one of the links, the whole, you, you couldn't talk to it, so you couldn't work. You couldn't make any update. If the central server went down, of course, everything fell apart. Git's improvement was to make the entire thing distributed, to make it offline first. This is the same thing that Bitcoin did in a sense. Uh, any node in this network is capable of maintaining its own record of the versions and talk to each other. Uh, so if part of the network goes down, doesn't matter, anybody can still work and you'll sync back when you get together. Uh, if the servers go down, doesn't matter at all, you can still work and talk to each other. This is what IPFS is doing to the entire web. Uh, we're moving the web apps and websites and documents and archives and everything that you can touch on the web to work this way. Uh, it's what I call hyperspeed because it's really fast. If you download something and you, and you have it locally and you have the hash, you never have to download it again. You beat the biggest problem, which is the speed of light. Uh, and so it allows you to, to think very differently about how to move content through the network and it, th it allows you to move uh, things preemptively, uh, to have caches that are untrusted and so on. So uh, IPFS is creating this massive mesh, this authenticated mesh where any piece of data can point to any other piece of data through a Merkle link. And the critical thing here is that you're not pointing to, a, to an HTTP server wh which might change, you're pointing with the cryptographic hash, which means you know exactly what piece of document you were pointing to. It's what everyone here wants out of the blockchain, or you want some of the things that people want out of the blockchain, right? As, as I've listened to people talk throughout the blockchain workshop, many people that are interested in blockchain, not from a um, you know, smart contract sense, but from a, as a way to store data, it's the same thing. It's, it, you get the same kind of properties here. Uh, and so this is, this is a, 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 a different way of, of thinking about how to store information. You can, you, the important property of the blockchain is that it's timestamps, right? And so you can think of putting data on IPFS and taking the, the root hashes from IPFS and then timestamping them into the blockchain. 
and vice versa. You could take the blockchain itself and put all of it on IPFS. In fact, there's people that are starting to build blockchains that are designed to be entirely on IPFS because it makes people's life easier. Like you don't have to work, do all this uh, peer to peer stuff that is difficult. Uh, so when you think about websites today, they work kind of like this, right? There's a whole bunch of, of servers uh, that talk to each other and of course there's clients too. And everybody has a big database and the data is kind of like within the, the databases and that's it. And you talk to each other over these wires. Uh, but the problem is that all of that data is really interlinked, but those links again refer to servers. Uh, in the IPFS model, it's, a, it's about flipping that on its head and saying, let the data connect to each other um, and so on. And of course, if anybody remembers linked data and the semantic web, this is the same idea, right? Like let data connect to each other. Um, the one issue though is that the linked data was still dependent on those links. It's still dependent on, um, uh, on those servers. It's, it's still addressed by uh, mostly, not all linked data is addressed this way, but the large majority of, of linked data is addressed by, um, by those locations. And so it makes it extremely difficult to work with because those links can go down. You don't want to query like 20 servers at once and so on. What you really want is something like Git or the blockchain where you can take entire portions of data, move them to one location, even completely go offline and still have everything in operation. Uh, and so yeah, it's, it's about deprioritizing the, the, the servers and the, and the websites and really thinking just about the data. And you know, when you think about uh, web application data, you could think about this huge graph of content and instead of making your, designing your web application as content stored in some like model in a database through SQL, you make a Merkle object where the links that you're linking between those objects and each other are Merkle links, which allows you to get all of these other properties, all of the cryptographic verification and so on. And you can sign all of this stuff as well and then get even an extra integrity check, which is you can see who generated the stuff. This is amazingly useful if you wanna create any kind of distributed website where users are creating the content and moving it around for you. And you can do, of course, like legal records this way. You can have a contract that's Merkle linked by a signature, and then the signed contract becomes like pointers to those signatures and like a legal agreement, or like a, you know, my legal agreements could be just pointing to a whole bunch of signed contracts. And then I could take that root and just timestamp it into the Bitcoin blockchain every once in a while and keep a record that way. Uh, and so it's this massive mesh that it's, um, it's really all about. It's about creating this, this distributed network where data can link to each other in this with Merkle links and you can move it around pretty easily. Uh, turns out that to be a lot of, uh, it, pretty much like the barrier to this is making new ways of, like basically matching all the interfaces that people are expecting out of how you make websites and web applications, uh, but make it all wor work with this kind of distributed um, effort. But cool, all right. so. Hopefully that explains what IPFS is about. Uh, let me check time and see how we're doing. Ooh, it's super late. I'll take a couple of minutes to tell you about the project itself uh, because I think it's important. So this, this started because I wanted to build a, uh, a versioned data set package manager. So I wanted to make it easier for scientists to move around data. And simultaneously, I also wanted to make a, uh, like some sort of storage layer for some sort of like distributed agents that could talk to each other. But that was kind of like a secondary goal. Um, and as I got into, into merging Git and BitTorrent, I realized that you could actually just sync in and restructure how the, the data structures worked, make a better protocol, and use that instead. And as I started thinking more and more about it, uh, it became clear that this had vast implications for the web itself. Uh, and it's only sort of after the fact that this became clear. Um, the interesting sort of crossover with blockchains is that it can serve both as a way to give links to all the blockchains out there and as a way to put the blockchains on there itself. Uh, so it makes implementations easier, but it also makes it easy to talk between blockchains, right? So if you have a link from a Bitcoin transaction to an Ethereum transaction, you can make that through IPFS and it would be way easier because the same sort of links, right? It's, it's again about creating this thin waste uh, where everyone can, can have one uh, way of formatting data. And if we follow that one thing, then everything can, can talk to each other again, right? Like let's not break the web. Um, and uh, uh, so this, this is of course all open source uh, as all important protocols should be. Uh, 
and it's you know there's a huge community now behind this uh, I sort of started it but even the ideas came before me like um, this is kind of the product of decades of and thinking and engineering from a lot of really good people um, my task has been mostly integrating ideas into pr producing a good interface that matches all of the pieces uh, and there's a, again a large community on it already there's tons of users uh, lots uh, hundreds of contributors um, and also uh, quite a bit of traction already so we we describe our project as an alpha uh, and yet people are using it in production all over the place uh, there's like like I said 50 to 100 thousand websites on it there's tons of different blockchain or Bitcoin or ethereum related companies that are using it uh, it recently was shipped in a very large uh, provider of like network attached storage devices with a massive install base so that'll be interesting when that comes online. Um, it's, it's gaining a lot of traction and moving really quickly, uh, which is great. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's uh, kind of important to, so, to keep, to kind of like step back and, and think about how this pro project is, is moving forward um, and, and say a, a little bit, a couple of um, statements about how these, what, what made this successful uh, whereas so many other projects that tried to do this in the past uh, weren't able to garner a lot of interest. I think it's critical for those people of you who might want to create different protocols and get other people to um, contribute and help push them. It is, it is critical to think through the whole thing and think about how it's going to interface with every other project out there and every single thing that people touch. And if you can generalize and generalize and generalize and like just do this over and over and over again, you'll end up with something that's very, very small and very simple uh, with all these pieces that will make it usable uh, to other people. Um, but then you'll have something that actually works and that people can get behind. Uh, so I think so many times people don't do this and it's a, a problem. Uh, and uh, I started a company to, to build this out uh, because I, I wanted to, to have like an independent group. Uh, and I think this is another another thing that's uh, important about how these protocols uh, emerged. When you think about Bitcoin, it was a person anonymous put it out there. When you think about Git, it was built by the kernel hackers, not a company. Uh, when you think about BitTorrent, it was built by one individual and so on. Critical pieces of the infrastructure of the network are emerging from all sorts of random places because really good ideas uh, come about. People uh, have the stomach to carry them out and build them and deploy them. But what I want to build is a, a lab where uh, it's completely open source and people can come together and work on things, no matter what organization they're part of, and sort of like a, like a strong arm for the IETF, a group that can take uh, the, mo the moment to look at the whole internet stack, think about what's missing, what would be really important to add, and then just do it. Uh, so that's what's, what the effort behind IPFS is becoming. It's about creating a lab like this. Uh, a, we call it the protocol lab. Um, it's kind of like Tesla uh, meeting the, uh, the protocol stack. But uh, if we go back to the slide about specs, code, and computers, the, the problem that we have today is that so much research exists. And it's great. I mean, it's amazing that there is so much research and so many good ideas. But the issue that I see often is that academia is like 25 years ahead. It's light years ahead. Uh, we, it's like alien technology to us, to like us mere mortals. And the issue is that so much of what we're talking about today has been solved already by academics decades ago. And why are we not seeing those results today? And it's because this funnel is broken. It's because when we go from research to development, there's a huge gap. Uh, most academics come up with really great ideas uh, and move on to the next paper. But very few people actually take the time to implement those pieces of ideas into a system. Then beyond developing something, from going to development to deployment, there's a huge, again, a huge filter because very few things actually are developed well enough to be good engineering systems that people can actually use and will actually use. And beyond that, if, even after you develop something, even after you deploy it, if you don't think very carefully about how, how to launch it, if you don't think very carefully about how to get people to kindle the fire of using it, it just won't happen at all and it'll die again in the dirt. And so by the time it gets to what people use, it's been filtered so many times by these very huge <laughs> probabilities that we get almost nothing. Uh, and so 
I urge all of you who kind of presented and talked about problems that have you know technical questions to read more literature because it is it is just filled with the answers that you're seeking. It's just that it just hasn't been deployed in such a way that you can use. Uh, and so focus on that. And this is kind of like what I'm building Protocol Labs to be, a research and development and deployment outfit that can f fix this filter to some degree. So anyway, uh, this is uh, the IPFS project, how it relates to blockchains and so on. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Thank you. Thank you. Can you just stay there for, for, for a moment? Sure. Um, I have some tech to introduce you that might help with that gap. Um, I do want to enable some time for questions. Maybe we have one question. Okay. Someone who hasn't asked. Have you both asked? You haven't asked. Sorry. MC privilege. And my hammer. Uh, I, I haven't looked. I have like only played around a little bit with IPFS. It's a very in, uh, interesting project. Um, my question is: It looks very good for like static content. What about dynamic content? For instance, if I have like a Twitter, like if I go to Twitter, then Twitter generates on the fly my newsfeed. And uh, yeah, yeah. So so I don't so I don't know the content. Yeah, yeah. yeah so I can't know the hash beforehand. So uh, I'll, I'll describe it in terms of Git first, and maybe that'll make sense. Uh, Git has a whole bunch of static content inside, and a branch pointer just moves to do mutability. That didn't make sense. So uh, you have this massive amount of static content, uh, but what you need to do to get mutability is that you need a pointer that can move somewhere. That is not an immutable content pointer, it's a mutable pointer. Uh, and we get that with naming. We call them names. Yeah, it's like get branches, but it's we call them names. And so in the if we go back to this, like, slide way back uh, about the links. Here we go. Uh, you see there that I have uh, slash IPFS slash a hash. That is a hash based on the content of the file. Then above it is, is a thing called slash IPNS for namespace. Uh, there is a DNS name, right, example.com. What that means is that there is a DNS record out there that has the latest version that has a, a text record pointing to that content. Of course, that's not the best solution. You don't want to wait for DNS resolution to get updates, right? You want it to be less than a second, ideally less than milliseconds sometimes. Uh, and you get that through another layer, which I, I don't show here, but that's where SFS naming comes in. Uh, a name or a branch in, in IPFS just means the hash of a public key. So if you have a private key, that means you can create a pointer to some content in IPFS and publish a record through some system. And people can trust that name. So the name is ugly, right? It's a huge hash. It's not a nice, pretty name. But people can trust that name because it's authenticated, right? It's like the name itself is the hash of a public key. From that, they fetch the public key, and f they can verify that you signed the record correctly. What's that? Like an onion URL? Yeah, exactly, actually. Yeah, so SFS naming is all over the place. It's in, it's in onion. It's in uh, Freenet, Nunet, uh, Tahoe LFS. There's just tons of things that use it. And these are, by the way, other projects that are related to IPFS and have been thinking about the same sort of, sort of ideas. So definitely check those out. Um, and yeah, if there's anything that we should do better, please come tell us, because we want to make the best thing possible. So for those of you, Merkle Dags, New York Glass, you've got the next 20 years you can play around. This is absolutely, <laughs> absolutely awesome. Thank you. So put it together for Juan. Thank, Thank you. you so much.